The technology that's available to us today feels pretty amazing. After all, it's letting you watch this video right now. That would have been possible in the 1990s. Despite that, the technology of the past can be just as impressive. In fact, it's sometimes so amazing that we're sometimes at a loss to explain how it worked or even how anyone came up with the idea in the first place. Let's check out some of the examples so we can show you exactly what we mean. Iran isn't exactly short of beautiful old buildings, but few can match the beauty of Ali Kapu. It was built during the Persian Empire Safafid era of the early 1600s in Nakshi e Jahan Square, Isfahan, on the orders of Shah Abbas I. The most remarkable room inside the palace is the music hall, which is where the king would entertain his guests and host his royal parties and receptions. Both scientists and architects alike consider it to be a work of acoustic genius. The double walls with their various niches carved in vase-like shapes are designed to absorb echoes and effectively create a quadraphonic sound system centuries before the same effect could be created through electric power transmission. If you were to stand in the middle of the room and clap, you wouldn't hear an echo despite the chamber's vast size. This incredibly clever design meant that all of the king's party guests could hear every note that his live musicians played on their sitars and X without distortion. The niches act as sound diffusers. It's a sound engineering masterpiece from 400 years ago. Most religions believe that their gods live in the sky. So based on that belief, it's a surprise that there aren't more places like Abuna Yamada Gu in East Tigray, Ethiopia. Its nickname is the Church in the Sky. And while it's not quite that high in the air, it certainly takes a determined climber to reach it. The only way up is by scaling a sandstone cliff face to its pinnacle with a 650-foot drop waiting for you if you make one wrong move. Only a few dedicated priests ever travel to the church in the sky, but they do so several times a week and risk their lives on the 45-minute climb every time. The journey even takes you past an open-air graveyard filled with the skeletal remains of the priests of the past. Although the current generation of priests claim that none of them met their maker after falling off the cliff, the church was carved into the sandstone by a priest named Father Yamada during the 5th century. Nobody knows why he did it. Some say he was fleeing persecution, while others say he climbed the cliff face in search of true divinity. Over the centuries, the interior of Father Yamada's church has been added to with stunning painted frescoes of the Apostles of Christ and an ancient Orthodox Bible made of goatskin sheets. The Fortress of Sacsayhuaman in Peru is already known and respected as a place of ancient wonder. It might even be more wondrous than any of us realize. According to the research of Igor Levashov, some of the stones involved in the construction of the fortress show clear signs of being cut with laser technology. There are places where the rock seems almost to have melted with none of the chipping or tool marks that you'd expect to see if the rocks had been carved by people working with nothing other than hand tools. This is an obvious problem for historians and scientists as the idea of the Inca having lasers seems ridiculous. It's possible that they have a different method for heating rock up to a very high temperature so it could be carved more easily. But we have no idea what the technology might have looked like or how it worked. It's possible that the stones were already here by the time the Inca came along and they simply repurposed them. If so, we have to ponder the existence of a pre-Inca race that had access to high technology and yet somehow disappeared from history without leaving a trace elsewhere. The Romans left the British Isles 1,600 years ago. That's a very long time. But their influence is still felt strongly today. The Romans were responsible for revolutionary changes in the way that buildings were designed and heated in the country, as well as introducing methods of sewage disposal, laying roads that still exist, introducing the first currency to the land, and even many of the words and phrases that are still used in everyday English. If you want to know how far ahead of their time they were with plumbing, check out this ancient Roman tap. 
The particular example we can see in these images is of a tap in the Archaeology Museum of Ache de Cienciano in Italy. But the same design was used in countless places in Britain. It's made from bronze and would have been used to drain water from a cistern. Archaeologists believe that the Romans first started using taps like this as long ago as 2100 years. Plenty of other cultures and civilizations had pipes and reservoirs by then, but being able to drain water and keep it in place by switching a tap on or off was a purely Roman luxury. Since we're talking about amazing inventions that involve water, this would be a good time to introduce Mexico's chinampas. They're quite literally floating gardens, and they were essentially invented through necessity. The Aztec Empire contained 6 million people by the early 1500s, so finding new ways to exploit the land around them for resources was crucial for survival. This idea might not have started with them, though. Some historians believe that the Chinampa agriculture was developed in Mesoamerica hundreds of years before the Aztecs came along. Regardless of whether that's true or not, the Aztecs took the idea and made it bigger. They developed a standard size and orientation for chinampas, creating dozens of them in concentrated areas, then building canals to connect them. Each one was defined by staking out a rectangular area on the lake bed, then joining the stakes with wattle. The fenced-in area would then be filled with decaying vegetation and mud to keep the roots of anything they tried to grow above water level. Because of the narrow canals between each chinampa, it looked like they were floating on the water, hence the nickname. 5,000 years ago, an ancient culture called the Trapilians lived inside Vertiba Cave in the Tenempil region of Ukraine. When traces of their presence were first recorded by archaeologists almost 200 years ago, it was thought that the Trapilians had only taken shelter here temporarily while on a journey to some other place. A more recent study suggests they considered it a permanent home. After excavating underground passages built by the Trapilians, archaeologists have found primitive stoves carved into the floor, surrounded by bedding made from plant fibers. Based on the evidence that's been left behind in these stoves, they would deliberately fill the space with broken ceramics before lighting fires. The fire would heat up the ceramics, which would then continue to give out heat for up to three times longer than the fire would sustain on its own. In a way, they turned the smashed pottery into batteries that kept them warm while they slept. We already knew the Trapilians were skilled at making figurines from bone and stone, but now we know that they were also accomplished heating engineers. We're returning to the ancient Romans now, and more specifically, the question of how they kept their beer cold. In mid-2018, Swiss archaeologists completed a months-long study at the Roman site of Augusta Rarica in their home country. They wanted to understand the purpose of several mysterious underground shafts that the Romans created there. Their experiments proved that beer could be kept cold on ice at the bottom of these 16-foot-deep shafts for up to three months at a time, thus supporting the idea that they were used as refrigerators. The experts now believe that the Romans would place anything they wanted to keep cool at the bottom of the shafts, pack them full of compacted snow ice, then cover them with straw to insulate the snow. Beer would have been one of the things they kept in their refrigerators, but it's also likely that they used them to keep wine, cheese, and oysters cool during the summer months. Of course, just because the shafts can be used as refrigerators doesn't mean that's definitely what the Romans used them for. But neither archaeologists nor scientists have any better ideas. In the year 55 BCE, the Germanic tribes living on the non-Roman side of the River Rhine thought they were safe from the threat of Roman invasion because crossing the river to attack would be too difficult for them. They were wrong. Under the guidance of Julius Caesar, the Romans invented the fast assembly pontoon bridge. These sturdy but easy to build bridges allowed Caesar's armies to carry out shock and awe attacks at speed, often taking their enemies by surprise and defeating them easily because they were unprepared. The bridge that took the Romans over the Rhine was over 1,000 feet long, which is a testament to the ingenuity of its builders. 
Long after Caesar was assassinated, Caligula came to be the emperor of Rome in the year 37. Many historical sources say that Caligula was insane, and one of the biggest displays of his insanity was ordering an enormous pontoon bridge to be constructed across the entire Bay of Bay, so he could triumphantly ride his horse across it. There are differing opinions about whether Caligula's bridge was ever actually built or not, but it must have been quite a spectacle if it was. The Dazu rock carvings in Chongqing, China might be the most elaborate and remarkable collection of their kind in the whole world. The site consists of several thousand detailed, delicately crafted stone carvings, most of which are religious in nature. Rather than being dedicated to one religion, though, the idols you'll find here are drawn from Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. It's thought that the first of the sculptures and statues were created during the 7th century, but additions were made for 500 years beyond that before stopping suddenly for unknown reasons. The sculptures that aren't religious tend to represent normal ancient Chinese people performing the tasks of their everyday lives, like caring for their children and farming the land. Official sources say there are more than 60,000 individual pieces among the collection. The Chinese government kept the existence of the Dazu rock carvings a secret even from their own people until the 1960s, which is when the site was opened up to domestic tourism. The invitation was extended to the rest of the world in the 1980s, so now it's a major visitor attraction. High on a hilltop in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, is the Siksikai Satapi Medicine Wheel. That's quite a mouthful, which is why most of the locals prefer to call it the Nose Hill Medicine Wheel. This is a First Nations monument built in the present, but with a connection to a far more mysterious past. The Medicine Wheel was created by members of the Blood Tribe in 2015 during the yearly Blackfoot Confederacy Conference. The shape of the wheel is based on the Siksikai Sitapi logo, which represents the four tribes that make up the confederation. It's a new way of marking a place that's been important to First Nations people for far longer than anyone can remember. The hilltop is covered in the remains of what are thought to be old stone circles. It's thought that the stones once held down teepees, from within which people kept watch over the land below. The design of medicine wheels is ancient, and even the tribes don't know what their original purpose was. Some appear to be graves, not all of them. Some align with the stars, but some don't. The oldest of them in North America was created 4,500 years ago. We're free to assume that they had a specific purpose, but we have no idea what that purpose could have been. There are more things that we don't know about the ancient city of Teotihuacan in Mexico than we do know. The Aztecs gave it its name, but this stone city was built by hand more than a thousand years before the Aztecs arrived. Nobody knows who built it or why. Not having that information makes it almost impossible to understand the purpose of the deep tunnels that run beneath the Pyramid of the Moon. It's so well hidden that archaeologists didn't find it until 2017. The tunnel is perfectly straight, some would say almost too perfectly straight for people who were presumably working with hand tools. It's also very deep at 33 feet below ground level. The tunnel's depth means that archaeologists haven't yet been able to reach it and perform an in-person investigation. We only know it exists at all because of breakthroughs in electrical resistivity tomography technology which allow us to see things deep beneath the ground by passing electrical charges through the earth. The best idea that historians have is that the tunnel might be a symbolic representation of the journey to the underworld, but that's little more than a semi-educated guess. We mostly know Leonardo da Vinci for his paintings, but we should give him more credit for his inventions. He wasn't just an artist, but a polymath with a brain full of ideas that wouldn't see the light of day until hundreds of years after his time. One of those ideas was the tank. Yes, Leonardo da Vinci came up with a full blueprint for a combat device that could only be described as a tank. It was such a sophisticated vehicle that it had a retractable top 
to allow the driver a greater field of vision and mountings for blunderbusses to be placed to fire on enemies. There are, however, several issues that would make da Vinci's tank fairly useless on any battlefield of his era. For one, the wheels are thin and would quickly get stuck in the mud. The axle had a crank design that doesn't seem right for the wheels it's supporting, and the whole thing is made out of wood. All it would take is one hit from a flaming arrow to set da Vinci's tank on fire, and it'd be curtains for anybody trapped inside it. Still, though, to have the idea at all so many years before tanks became a reality in the First World War is nothing short of remarkable. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.